Okay. All right, clap one. On three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash, and as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Uh, I won't lie, tad nervous. Uh, as we were doing the clap, suddenly I had a second that just jolted in my brain of, oh, shit. Did I put that episode on YouTube? <laughs> I'm realizing now uh, the episode I'm thinking of, uh, we're literally recording it right now. So, no, I haven't. That's always that's when you know they're really starting to bleed together. <laughs> they're, they're bleeding together yeah. like like two ladies cycling in the same home. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, I uh, I went to the doctor today because, again, as everyone knows, I've uh, I was sick and then I got over it and I'm sick again course and i was talking to him and he's wonderful wonderful older man and he said to me you sound like rod stewart Uh uh-huh but you're better looking and i was like you know what i'll take that because that's the low level kind of sexual harassment that i miss (laughs) uh Uh, i don't think it was sexual harassment I'm, i'm kidding but you know what i mean i was like who gets hurt who gets hurt? Not me. Not you. Not my ego. <laughs> uh, I I like that. I like it a lot. Rod Stewart. I like the randomness of that. Well, and it made me think about, not to go back to my Vegas birthday, but in Vegas, we had a party bus. Yes. Pick us up from the oh airport God, to take right. us to take us to the hotel. And they were like, there's a problem right now with the Bluetooth. Like the driver was like, I'm like, you can't connect your phone, but there's some music stored in the system. And what was stored in the system? Three songs total. Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio and two Rod Stewart songs. Yeah. Yeah, it was a vibe, I guess you could say. And then it was like, well, we got through all three. I guess we go back to Coolio now. Oh, Coolio was just on repeat at that point. At that point, yeah. It was trafficy. It took us some time. So we we did cycle through. Now, what yeah. were the Rod Stewart songs? Do you remember? Oh man. Um wasn't like if you want my body and you was think that I'm one sexy. I... Come on, baby, let me know. No. no. I, I oh I know the song. I just don't know if that was one of the ones that was on there. I'm struggling now. I'm like, was that Rod Stewart? Because in my head, I hear Mike Myers <laughs> singing it in So I Married an Axe Murderer. Same. Uh, God, I love that show so much. Uh, I what are They were definitely hits, weren't they? Like Rod Think Stewart so. hits? Well, I'm going to quickly uh, Google Rod Stewart hits to see if any... Uh, uh, well... Do you think I'm sexy? I do think that was one. I I don't think have you ever seen the rain was the other <laughs> one. Oh, no. Have I told you lately? Definitely wasn't. No. Rhythm of my heart was a no. Um, Am I missing? It was some wasn't guys very... have all the luck. That was one of them. Yes. That was it. That was it. Yes. Because it, it was a it was we couldn't even figure out who would be on this party bus that would want to hear that song. It is. Let's get the drinks uh, yeah. flowing. Let's crank it. <laughs> Some Put guys on. have all the luck. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I turned to you and I was like, what do they call the fans? And then I was like, oh no, I'm thinking of Barry Manilow and the fans. <laughs> yeah, we never did figure out what you call Rod Stewart fans. Stewies? Oh. Stewies. Yeah, Lost that's... my mind. Mm-hmm lost it or have never been more in tune stew hards no the stew hards i don't know i kind of like that if they don't have a name just let us know we'll come up with something we'll noodle on it we'll noodle on it um stew hard makes me think of a wrestling uh grandfather to to the wrestling world stew hart father of course of brett and owen and many others, but of course, I was like, I do not know that name, but I do know Bret Hart, of course. Yeah, yeah. Huh. 
I mean, <laughs> I'd a peek back if I ever had time as to how many times wrestling randomly came up on this show. I think it comes up a fair amount. At least every once in a while. Well, since China, certainly. Oh, of course. But I mean, within the last couple of weeks, uh, something came up in a conversation I was having with my husband. Something came up about wrestling, and I mentioned Raw and the two of us and how much we loved watching Monday Night Raw. And then I went into like a 10-minute tirade about my ex-boyfriend's mother who oh, yeah. screwed us out of watching raw that night when that's what we had planned yeah we got kidnapped briefly we have should... we told that story on the podcast i before? do believe we did, did but it was just i shouldn't have this much anger about that to this day but i do she's not yeah. in my life anymore no and thank god but i still have so much anger about that because yeah. that's the thing people don't get about us when we are together everyone's like so what are your plans we don't tend to make a lot of plans because a lot of people are fortunate enough to live in the same city or very close to uh their best friend and they can go hang out whenever they want well we don't get to hang out in person so most of the time we just just let us be garbage humans yep Laying down, shoveling garbage into our mouths. Oh, that reminds me. I should go get my can of frosting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just let us, we, we just want to like have something on, whether we watch it or not, either way. Uh, and we just want to like lay there and be near each other. And that's it. We don't have to have other plans. That plan specifically involved watching Raw together for the first time. Yeah. And we were so excited. Yeah. And that bitch <laughs> shamed me for not taking Lauren on a fucking tour that she never asked to go on. Didn't but want it. Didn't need it. And we were shoved in the back of a van. And yeah. And sent through the picturesque mountain town of, was it specifically Banff? Jasper. Was it? Ja it was Jasper, Alberta. There we go. Yeah. 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 We did see a double rainbow. <clears throat> that was nice. Uh, didn't care. I, but I've seen them before and I've seen them since. You know, like, it, it, again, yeah. for me, sure. But to your point, it's like, we don't need to see the sights. That's not, we don't need to, yeah. it's, I'm not a tourist. I'm here to see her. And quite often what happens is we may even have some sort of loose idea of what we want to watch like that. But what happens with us, and I know the dear listeners are not going to be shocked by this hot piece of goss. But it, we, it takes on a life of its own. Stuff comes up that then all of a sudden we are hyper fixated on that it's like, you know, <laughs> it like all of a sudden we're watching every terrible Lifetime movie possible that we can get yeah. in in that amount of time. Like, yeah. we just are, we're like sharks. We keep swimming or we'll die. Like, like there's always yeah. a new idea. There's always something to chase. And, and that's the magic and the beauty of it. We never anticipated that as kids we'd get into the male gymnastics. No. In the Olympics. I mean, but we sense. did. And then it became all consuming for that trip. There's always something yeah. that ends up being all consuming for us. But we can't have that joy if you force us into a van to look at mountain goats. Oh, look at the animals, girls. Shut the fuck up, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, still a little bit of anger yeah. uh, towards her. Rightly so. Rightly so. She well, the other thing about us, nice and I think that the listeners them. probably know this by 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 now as well, is that we yep. we hold grudges. We are grudge holders. We do. Yep, we do. It is one of the best things that I do. Yeah, like I'm one of the things I'm the best at. Yeah, if oh, I'm I very good at it. The last words that will come out of my mouth will be "fuck you, Deb." Yep. On yep. my deathbed, it's the last thing I'll say is "look at the animals, girls," <laughs> like in a really angry voice. I guarantee it. And then I'll be like, she's gone. I love that I'm watching you. <laughs> I also like that in this case, you're going to call it. You're going to call the time. You're just going to go, oh, 3.52 p.m. <laughs> and look, that's oh the way I God. want it. That's the way I want it. I don't think I'd want that for you. Um, but... I mean, isn't that supposed to be the thing you want? Your 
old and surrounded by people that you love. Yeah. Oh, look at those animals, girls. Yeah, I yep. still have a lot of anger there. Uh, but good God, think of all the things that we do on a trip that ends up being the most fun we ever have that we don't see coming. Yes. Like when you came here uh, for my birthday a couple of years ago, we suddenly went, okay, let's check out mini brands. And suddenly it was like eight trips to the store, cackling so hard, covered in mini brands, yep. plastics, which we recycled. Yep. Um, and then uh, was it, oh God, I might be misremembering which trip it was. Was it during, I think it was during the Celebrity Family Feud trip where we got into Shopkins. Yes. I think that was that trip. But then I think it was the quarantine trip when I was there during the Kelly Clarkson stuff. I think, oh, or maybe that was when we did Shopkins. No. Oh, that might was, have just been brands. It was brands because that was still early pandemic. You're right. Because you had to spend those days in, <laughs> in quarantine when you got home and you forever yeah. changed. <laughs> oh, I... It like that's people might think like oh I'm sure she didn't completely change for life uh, oh I I think if you go back and listen to episodes before that point there's a certain level and then since that point there is a husk of a woman <laughs> that mentally that was left behind yeah um, for sure but us getting into Shopkins and going to like five different targets. You being like, well, I mean, there's one not far away. And then we why just is that happening? Up. Why what's happening? Sorry. My my for some reason my do not disturb was off. And so I got a phone call coming through my computer. What hell? That's weird. Yeah. Through a computer. Through a computer. Anyway, I sorry. No, well, no. the thing about the, the thing I loved about the Shopkins was I know myself. And I was like, Christy yeah. was was really into them. And I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't take this on. Like, I can't take on another co collection. I just can't do it. Yeah. But I did request that I could open some of them with you. Of course. So then well, I would. You also checked off my list for me. That's the other thing that just, that's, that brings me a lot of joy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What I love is your ability to say, you know what? I have enough things collection wise. <laughs> gonna bow out of this whereas i go i would have loved that as a child heal my childhood trauma yeah i mean you should also it should be noted that like <clears throat> my house is still full of toys of course full of toys so you know it's i'm not saying that i'm a holier than thou it was more just that i was like i could see where this this addiction goes yes yeah oh yeah i mean look <laughs> you may have a lot of things but that's just because you take collecting seriously. I do. If you're gonna collect, you goddamn well collect. And I want Whereas, all of them. And yes. and it's like <clears throat> that's a burden. Oh, that's and a burden to start a new is, one. Yeah. I mean, mini brands is already a nightmare in itself. And we do different series, with exception. Um, I think the Disney one is our only because I'm obsessed with Venn diagrams, apparently. Yeah. I think Disney is the only mini brand that's in between for both. That's true. Because you te you're, you liked the gold ones, but they only did one series of the gold ones. That's right. And Oh, and then you did the foodie ones. Mm -hmm. And then I've done the <laughs> series one, two, three, and four. <laughs> both Disney's and the three toy series so far <laughs> yeah look like i i understand <laughs> when I'm you just, list I'm, them out i'm very proud of you for having the ability to go you know what i'm calling it stop yep. i this is too far shopkins was too far because there are so many and it it just doesn't make sense and the problem is i learned there were collector cases and that's what does me in yeah I have two of those now. I get it. It's fine. Yeah. I think my favorite of all of them is the foodies mini brands. I would like McDonald's foodies. 
that I want to push hold... me over the edge. Yep. Yep. Here are words universe. <laughs> McDonald's, <laughs> mini brand foodies. You know what? Let's let's take a minute. Yeah. Join me in prayer. <laughs> Patron Saint Ronald McDonald. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We don't ask for a lot. Nope. Also, we love your product. Love if it. There's any way that you could pull some strings and have the mini brands people do a complete McDonald's set of mini brands. You'd make these two Canadian gals' hearts sing. Yep. Yours and fries, Lauren and Christy. Oh, well, I'm writing down yours and fries. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, watch now we're gonna get com- we're gonna get complaints now that we're bringing religion into the podcast. Oh, I I mean, at some point, take a step back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not yeah. some things can just be lighthearted and fun. They don't we have don't to be- actually pray to Ronald. No, and if people want to pray to whatever God they believe in and want, you know. Great. Yeah. For you. Yeah. This is not us making fun of that. Nope. This is us making fun of ourselves. Yep. For how, and how much we are. We love McDonald's. McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if they also need a hand coming out with like what designs, I'm happy to help. That's very big of you because she you don't have a lot of time in the day. And I know you'd make I time don't. for McDonald's. I, absolutely would and here's the thing you're not going to get a little cardboard box that's going to be easily crushed you're not (laughs) i won't allow it (laughs) the serious (laughs) vehemence in your voice when you said you're not (laughs) it sounded like you were trying to defuse a bomb like it was like (laughs) that's the level that and and i don't doubt it that is the serious uh Diffusing a bomb is the level of seriousness that I bring to the table mini brands. Yep. So, And on that note, I'd like to show you what I'm drinking right now. A McDonald's Diet Coke. <laughs> hey oh, <laughs> Oh, I love that for you. Oh my God, I just realized that it's the state of California on here. What, the, what did you think it was? I just never, I never looked at it long enough. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, I just never lo- yeah. really looked. I never really digested what was on the cup. Of course. That's sad. It just feels like you're finally seeing today for the first time. <laughs> Your <laughs> eyes have been opened. <laughs> I'm a new woman, you yeah. know? I like that. Yeah. I like All that. we had to do was start pay- praying to our patron, St. Ronald McDonald. <laughs> yeah. And for less than the price of a cup of coffee a day. I'm kidding. I'm totally Look, kidding. I don't want to say that the ball itself has to be red. But it wouldn't <laughs> hurt. <laughs> you gotta stick yeah. with the colors. Also, I, I don't just want the fries in the red. I need the fries in the little white package. Like, I need the smaller ones. I need the different size drinks. I need multiple colored McFlurries. I need the little box of cookies. Again, cardboard, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Look, the thing is, what I've learned, mm. I, as a as a stay at home mom, sure, um, I did a lot of like crafty sort of things over the years for my children. Uh, like there was a time one of my children was home sick. I think he also might have been young enough; he wasn't at school full time yet. Uh, but he was obsessed with the Disney movie Cars, mm. and he was like, "I would like." Uh, I can't remember. God, I can't remember what it's called. But he wanted some sort of hotel, some sort of wheel. It's a huge, massive tire. Uh, He wanted this hotel. And so I made it out of a cardboard box for him. And he fucking loved it. Um, And I mean, I've purchased like the plastic pylons and cut a hole out of it and made that the cozy cone motel. And it's, you know, it's what I love to do. I love to I love to create things. Uh, And since doing this, I have not had a lot of time. And this afternoon, I was like, oh, I've got so many notes to work on uh, for the next episode. Uh, but then I was like, oh, I, I have this thing I've been putting off making for my youngest. It's a just like a mat that I, it's like a little tiny car road. 
And so I spent a few hours cutting out a mini McDonald's and making a little target complete with the big cement balls in front. Um, and I had so much fun. Time just went past so quickly. I was, I was in my glory. And wow. I have found I've really missed uh, making things and doing creative things like that because I, I live for it. I really do. <clears throat> I love this. And I mean, I was riding that high into this record. And then fucking Cheddar ruined it. Um, oh, God, I've realized now I've left it out. And it, I haven't covered it, so it's I haven't laminated that map yet. So it's currently just paper. And I swear to God, if she chews on it while we're in here, I'll, I'll have a stroke. But then I'll get to make it again and I'll be excited. But That's true. I'm also painting a, I'm making a custom Playmobil figure. It doesn't matter. Um, and I had the hair and I sanded it, which you have to be so gentle with the hair because it's very soft plastic. So if you sand even the tiniest bit too hard, it just starts coming off in very large chunks. It shouldn't. So I used like the finest sandpaper and just went very gently. So it was a lot of time. And then I primed it and I'm currently painting it. And after I painted it, I turned my back, left the room to go and make this creative uh, paper craft, if you will. And then I went back hours later to check on it and the hair was gone. And I was like, where did it go? I found it. Cheddar had taken it off the island and put it somewhere. But now it's covered in hairs that she took it when it was wet. So the hairs have been <sighs> bedded. So I'm going to have to sand it again and start over and I don't have a lot of time and I'm very annoyed by it. And some may be like, whoa, why do you assume it was cheddar? I, of the two, I have a little old lady who likes her naps and to be away from people. <laughs> and then I have a toddler who gets into everything. Yeah. And so I know it's cheddar. I know it was, but that really killed the excited creativity buzz that I had going on I was yeah. on a high and then I sobered real fast yeah as I ran around the house and checked every possible hidey hole that she has for all her treasures <laughs> couldn't find it couldn't find it then finally found it not happy yeah not happy but the point was god I love creating things with my hands what a great time I had. And because I love little things, well, it makes sense that yes, many brands would be in that world. So again, the things I would like to see. Well, very quickly, yes. as you were saying what you'd like to see in the McDonald's mini brands. Yes. Then I thought season two, McDonald's mini brands, retro. Oh. And it's all the old packaging we could do throughout the decades. Yeah. The special's got to be the McRib, like the limited oh, edition one. The little pizza. The little pizza. A shamrock shake. Then oh. season three, McDonald's around the globe. Oh. And then it's all the fun Lobster. items we don't have here. The McLobster. Yes. <clears throat> all the ones that we talked about uh, in that Patreon episode, I believe. <clears throat> oh, this, this writes itself. I'm also, when I, if there's going to be a box of nugs and you're damn right, there's going to be like a six and a 10, maybe even a 20. The box is going to be open so you can see the little nugs inside. Yeah. With the little sauces. Yep. God, I'm getting hot just thinking about it. <laughs> Well, listen, before you break out into a yeah. sweat, let's yeah. get into the episode. This is, of course, the next in our missing series of episodes that we've been doing on the show. Christy curates these. Uh, and this is, of course, Missing Queensland. Yeah. Which, of course, Australia. It is. I'm saying it right, right? Is it Queensland or is it Queensland? I have been saying Queensland. Um, and by that, I mean to myself. Got it. Every time I read it. So yep. I'm just assuming 
Oh God. I'm hope now I'm now I'm just really hoping. Well, well we apologize if we're not saying it as we should. Of course. So <clears throat> let's get into it. According to the Australian Federal Police, more than 38,000 people are reported missing in Australia every year, but that 98% are found within the first few days. As of February 2023, there are approximately 2,600 active missing persons cases in Australia. <clears throat> Christy has chosen to highlight 11 cases from the Queensland area to help shed some light on cases that might not normally make it to our show. So get ready for suspicious old men, heartbreaking stories, and more complaints about law enforcement as we delve into Missing Queensland. A Christy curation. <laughs> How about that? Look, I love that a lot. Um, I, yeah, I, I like the finding different ones. And this is, I think this is the third missing one we've done. Yes. Um, but again, I'm trying to go all over the place. So, uh, that's why I've branched out from North America. I love it. You know, that's why we're <clears> at. <throat> so, disclaimer, as always, this episode will contain mentions of sexual assault, so trigger warning for those who need it. And a reminder, as I tend to do in these specific compiled episodes, I will spend more time talking about some cases as opposed to others based solely on the amount of information that is available to me. And as always, my apologies in advance for mispronunciations. So the first case I'm getting into involves Norma June Pavich, who went by the name Simone Vogel. So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to refer to her as Simone, as that seemed to be her preference, I think. So Simone owned eight health studios, a.k.a. massage parlors. Got in it. Brisbane, which were making profits of about $4,000 a week, which is equivalent to over $19,000 in 2023. And just to clarify, I'm talking Australian dollars. So Simone was making about $13,000 US dollars a week. Simone withdrew some cash from two of her own studios and was last seen leaving her Con Tiki studio at Kedron in North Brisbane, on September 16th, 1977, Simone left the studio carrying carrying $6,000 cash and wearing about $100,000 worth of diamonds. She has not been seen or heard from since. Simone was 42 at the time of her disappearance. And to be clear, when I say massage parlor, I really mean brothel. Got it. Back then, brothels were illegal, so the businesses were called massage parlors to try and seem like legitimate legal businesses. And prior to 1992, control and regulation of prostitution fell under the Police Offenses Act of 1930, so some officers were willing to turn a blind eye for a price. Right. <clears throat> Simone allegedly paid corrupt police $3,000 every week to turn a blind eye to her business dealings. And one cop who ran Brisbane's licensing branch admitted that over the course of a decade, he received and distributed more than $3 million in corrupt payments. Wow. According to investigative reporter Matthew Condon, there was a list of brothel owners and sex workers who went missing or died of suspected drug overdoses in the 1970s and massive police corruption in Queensland from the 1950s through the 80s. An example of the alleged corruption, in June 1975, 33-year-old Shirley Finn, a brothel owner and mother of three, was found shot to death in her car in Perth, Western Australia. She'd been shot in the head four times at close range. Her car was found on the edge of the Royal Perth Golf Club. Robbery was ruled out as a motive, as Shirley was wearing thousands of dollars worth of jewelry at the time of her death. Police made some errors when investigating the case. When they made a map of the scene, they put Shirley's car near the fifth tee, which is more than 100 meters or 330 feet from the ninth tee where the car was actually found. 
And while that may seem insignificant, it meant that officers ignored many of the witness statements because they believed the witnesses were in the wrong location to have seen or heard anything. Right. Since police kept a close eye on Shirley's illegal business, Shirley had a close working relationship with the Western Australian police, and it is believed she may have been killed trying to blackmail corrupt officers. In 1985, a very senior police officer was being investigated for Shirley's murder. The officer, who was a vice squad chief, was alleged uh, was allegedly seen by witnesses on the night of Shirley's murder wrapping a gun in newspaper and putting it in a garbage bin just moments before a garbage truck arrived. There were 34 witnesses, witness statements in the case, but when the officer chose to retire early, the police decided that, quote, the matter was resolved. Oh, boy. And the police continued their corruption in Simone Vogel's case, a homicide detective named Keith Smith, initially worked Simone's case and said not only did he believe that Simone's husband had nothing to do with her disappearance, he also believed the police were involved. Keith submitted a report to his superiors suggesting members of the police force were potentially involved. Days later, Keith was removed from the homicide unit and his report on Simone's disappearance was shredded. Keith said, quote, I submitted that report as advised by my immediate supervisor, and it went through his office to the superintendent, who was Tony Murphy. It was headlined confidential, and within a couple of days, my boss said, Tony Murphy wants to see you in his office. Simone's brother, Bob Beniston, was a constable in Canberra. So when his sister went missing, Bob started to make his own inquiries about it, but then he received a threatening phone call from a Queensland police superintendent demanding that Bob stay out of it. In 1987, an inquiry was started to probe the link between corrupt police and brothels in Brisbane. The inquiry resulted in more than 250 people being charged, including four National Party ministers, police commissioner Terry Lewis, and 30 police officers, of the 250, 139 of those people were found guilty. Wow. One of the managers of Simone's studio said that she overheard Simone on the phone as she was leaving saying, quote, I'll meet you in the same parking spot that I met you at before about half past six. When Simone failed to return home, her husband, Stephen Pavich, reported her missing to the Surfers Paradise Police Station. He also called the studios, talking with employees to find when the last time anyone saw her. Stephen then asked a friend of his, who was a private investigator, to get involved. The following day, the private investigator found Simone's white Mercedes convertible, which Simone had purchased just 11 days prior, parked at the Brisbane Airport long-term car park. The car was <laughs> unlocked, but there was no sign of any struggle and the keys were missing. A taxi driver claimed he picked up a woman matching Simone's description on the afternoon she went missing. He had just finished his shift and was headed home when he picked her up outside of a hotel. The woman told the driver she was supposed to meet someone, but she must have gotten the location wrong. The driver suggested a motel that had a similar name to the hotel where the woman was, when they got there, the woman allegedly looked up to the first floor, saw a man on the balcony, and said that was the person she was supposed to meet. The driver left. The woman entered room 40, but it is unsure if that woman was actually Simone or not. In a 1982 coronial inquest, Simone was found to be most likely dead and most likely to have met with foul play. And on July 7th, 1994, Simone was officially declared dead. But as of February 2023, her case remains unsolved. Case number two. Yes. Anthony John Jones, known as Tony, was born in 1962. He was a lab technician who went missing on November 3rd, 1982, while hitchhiking during a six-month working holiday. 
His last contact was a phone call made from a public phone box on the outskirts of Townsville to his mother in Perth. During the call, Tony said he was planning to hitchhike west to Mount Isa to meet up with Tim, his older brother. Tony said he planned to travel along the Flinders Highway, which extends 906 kilometers or 562 miles. Tim waited at Mount Isa for several days, and when Tony failed to show up, Tim contacted their parents. Tony was officially reported missing a week after his last phone call. In 1983, an anonymous letter was sent to the police claiming that Tony's body was in the Fullerton Riverbed about 100 yards from the Flinders Highway. After an extensive search, police concluded the letter was a hoax. Years later, when DNA technology had improved, Tony's family requested DNA testing be done on the letter, but police said that wasn't possible because the letter had not been stored properly. But then when Tony's family insisted on testing the letter regardless, the police then had to admit they can't because they'd lost the letter. Oh, God. In 2011, an ex-convict told police that while serving time in Townsville Correctional Center, his cellmate once confessed to killing Tony Jones. Investigators identified the cellmate as 53-year-old Michael James Londis. However... Londis died before police ever questioned him. In 2014, there were rumors that Tony was killed and buried in the town of Huendon, about 350 kilometers or 217 miles southwest of Townsville. The rumor went that Tony got into a fight with Kevin Wright and Johnny Easthoff, and they killed him and dismembered his body at the slaughterhouse. Oh, God. Multiple friends and acquaintances of the men came forward to say the men had drunkenly confessed to Tony's murder multiple times over the years. One ex-girlfriend of Kevin Wright's said that Kevin told her everything, but when Kevin threatened her, she retracted her statement. Tony's family requested that the slaughter yards in Huendon be checked by ground-penetrating radar, but their request was denied due to insufficient evidence. Also in 2014, serial killer Andy Albury confessed to killing 14 people between 1970 and 1983, including Tony Jones. Albury refused to share any details, and what he did share was inconsistent with what police already knew. Also, Albury was born in 1961, so if he did murder somebody in 1970, he was only nine at the time. So I just don't buy what he's selling. Alberry is currently serving a life sentence for the murder of 29-year-old Gloria Pinden in Darwin in November 1983. Tony's family pushed for Tony's case to be looked at at an inquest, and it was started in 2016, which revealed police had not taken statements properly. They didn't follow up on leads or check the alibis of key suspects. Witnesses weren't interviewed, and a sketch of a person of interest was not released to the public until 10 years after Tony's disappearance. Tony's family discovered that the dental records in Tony's file were not Tony's. Oh my God! And since the family had given the police the only copy they had, there is no backup and the original records have since been lost. So imagine trying to identify that body and how, I mean, I just can't. Tony's family uh, also suggested that Tony may have been the victim of serial killer Ivan Malat, better known as the backpacker murderer. Malat killed two men and five women in New South Wales between 1989 and 1992. He would offer people rides while driving down Hume Highway, then take them to Belanglo, Belanjo, oh fuck, I can't say that. I should have looked this one up, but I didn't. I'm so sorry. Belanglo, State Forest. Uh, he would assault them, rob them, and murder them. Malat was convicted of the murders in July 1996 and was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences. He has always professed his innocence, but he died in prison in May 2019. Police ruled Malat out as a suspect in Tony's disappearance 
as they determined it was unlikely that Malat was in the area at the time. If it wasn't Malat, could it have been another serial killer? Several young people had gone missing or were murdered on Flinders Highway over the years, including 18-year-old Anita Cunningham and 18-year-old Robin Poinville Bartram, who went missing while hitchhiking together on July 4th, 1972. On November 15th of that year, Robin's body was found under a bridge 240 kilometers or 149 miles west of Townsville. She'd been sexually assaulted and shot twice in the head with a 22 caliber rifle. No sign of Anita has ever been found. Robin and Anita were two of seven female hitchhikers who were killed in Queensland between 1972 and 1976. So maybe whoever killed one or more of those women also killed Tony. No sign of Tony has ever been found and his bank accounts have never been touched. In 2002, an inquest ruled that Tony had likely been murdered, but no potential suspects were found. Tony's disappearance was the catalyst that led to the establishment of Australia's Missing Persons Week in 1988. Anthony Jones was 20 at the time of his disappearance. He was described as a Caucasian male, 175 centimeters or 5 foot 7, with a slim build, brown hair, and green eyes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Already. It's just the police stuff. It's just. I, the <laughs> dental records. That's unbelievable. Not only are these not his, but we've also lost his. Sorry. Yeah. And then my question is, whose do you have? And were they put in there deliberately? Like, you know, yeah. I think the thing for me is. It's a fool me once, shame on you, you know, boy who cried wolf situation here, considering sure. this anonymous letter that they're like, it's a hoax. It's a hoax. Well, maybe we should test it. Ah, not testable. No, we'd really like to test it. We've actually lost it. So it's like, that doesn't make me ever trust you again. And and then for it to be like, oh, oops, the wrong dental records are in this file. Like, how does that happen? How do the wrong dental records get put into someone's file? Like, how is that not checked? Like, there's names on them. So then it starts to feel like they were put in there deliberately. Right? So that it's like, they're there, but they're wrong, and they're hoping someone wouldn't notice to buy time or Lord knows what. That's the thing. Just imagine if they did find somebody who matched those dental records. And then his family would be like, well, here you go. And they, I mean, after this long, they wouldn't know. They'd be like, okay, great. We found him. That's at least some part of peace. It's not entirely, but it's at least something. And then it's like, what about whoever's dental records those actually are? Yep. But then it's And like, they would never know unless yeah? it was someone who was a wildly different size and they found the entire body or remains at right. that point and could- you know, prove that the height was off or, you know what I mean? Like, otherwise, yeah, you're right. They would be thinking that they had closure and another family would never get it. And it's, you know, it's such a disservice to both of those families. Unless it's like the absolute wild idea of they lost them, they knew they lost them, or they knew what happened to them and somebody put their own dental records in there because they're like they're never gonna find him they'll never find a match if it's my own yeah because i trust no one at this point oh we trust no one no we trust no one you can't no you can't do this for as long as we have which isn't even that long you can't do this for a month and not no. trust no one um yeah that's a wild story and you know obviously piggybacking on and I see what you did, you saucy minx. Uh, piggybacking on the first story and hearing yeah. about the level of corruption. Yeah. Nothing she does is by accident, folks. Uh, it, it also then, of course, is giving context that, yeah, maybe this dental record, maybe there is something else going on with Tony's disappearance that does involve the police. And that's why there's some sort of cover up happening. Because the level of corruption found not that much earlier right like 
it was going on in the 70s. He went on, he went missing in the early 80s. Like, not that I'm suggesting that that kind of level of corruption doesn't necessarily happen in many places all the time, but sure. that's a pretty, pretty big, you know, millions of dollars and, yep, you know, and then people getting threatened, like her brother getting threatened, her brother who's a cop getting that's threatened to leave it alone. He- Getting threatened even though he was also a cop? That's yeah. terrifying to me. Terrifying. Also, you know, um the 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 other the 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 report getting shredded. Yeah, not a fan of that. No. It also seems plausible, given that her, her last phone call that was overheard. It seems plausible if she was like, I'll meet you in the same place I met you before. That this could have been her going to make a payment. I mean, we also know she had $6,000 cash on her. So it feels like this could be her going to meet her crooked cop. Especially when she admitted to somebody prior to that, that she was paying $3,000 a week. So it's two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. I mean, I guess then the question becomes, what's the motive? I mean, you know, this is always where I go. I like to build a profile. What's the motive for killing her? She's a good source of bribe money. So why would, why would that cop want to stop that flow of money? Unless... You know, it feels like there's obviously a layer to that that we don't know in terms of motive. It just doesn't feel, it it feels impossible for it to be like a random murder. Oh, yeah. I truly think it was maybe a case of, look, I pay you normally $3,000. i am giving you $6,000 as a final payment. That's a possibility. And that pissed him off. And then it was, then then suddenly they're $3,000 a week is gone i could see that because again don't trust them in any way no Mm -mm. Mm -mm. especially when another cop is like hey i actually think cops are involved and a higher up is like hey send this on to an even higher up and he does and they shred the file and remove him from the homicide unit you don't do that when you're innocent. No, you don't. You don't. What's silly to me also, both in this case and in Shirley's case, is that if it was someone connected to law enforcement, yeah, why wouldn't you stage the scene and make it look like a robbery? Yeah. Like you were saying with Shirley, it's like, well, she was covered in all kinds of jewelry. You, the, the same of Simone. Yeah. You could have easily staged a scene taken all of her jewelry, taken the money. Yeah. Right? So it's like, that's an interesting choice too. I wonder, is it also possible, we're just spitballing here. Of course. Is it also possible that there's a third party involved? Oh. I'm going to say it. Sure. The mob. Oh. Is it possible that there was some sort of mob involvement she's having to pay two separate entities she's like i can't keep doing this yeah and then the mob took her out well especially if she's making four grand a week and she has to pay three grand it's wild like so maybe maybe it's a case of she made some friends aka the mob and the mob was like i'll do it for two and so it's like okay give this one their last payment and then they didn't like it oh uh, that's possible or the mob turned on her yeah but again if why didn't they why wouldn't i guess they maybe took her jewelry cuz we don't know cuz her body well, was never right. found but um I just assume something similar happened to Simone that happened to Shirley. Yeah. 
both women, successful women who owned several brothels, and they both were last seen with like a ton of jewelry. And then Shirley was just found like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Only other theory. Sure. If we know the police are bribing her. Yes. Then it's probably safe to say they're also using her business. They're, they're... Oh, I could see that. Is it possible there had been a bad experience with one of the employees and a cop. Is it possible the cops weren't paying and she's going to them and saying, I cannot pay your bribes and also let you have freebies. Maybe one of their, one of the guys got rough with one of the girls. Exactly. Was she like, we have a problem here. Yeah. And they didn't like being told that there's a problem. Right. Because they run the show. Right. Right. I could see that. That's the only other thing. Because again, when looking for motive, when they are actively benefiting from her and her going missing or, you know, being killed, which tragically it does feel like is probably the case. Sure. Um. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, well, then what's the motive? And it feels to me like it's like it's it's either. Yeah. Revenge, uh, you know, or it's trying to cover up for something else. Right. I mean, I guess I should also say because her car was found at the airport, um, there's, I mean, there's the whole, like, did she just go off and start another life? I doubt it. She was bringing in really good money. She was happily married. And at the time of her disappearance, she was planning a birthday party for her son, who I believe was turning 21. So yeah, it just I don't know. felt like there was no way, reason she would just cut and run. I think whoever she had that meeting with, it didn't turn out well. Yeah. Yeah. Also, she said, I'll meet you at the same parking spot. Who's to say they didn't meet at long-term parking at the airport? More than possible. Because who's checking out what's happening way out in long-term parking? They yeah, didn't have great security point. Security cameras at that point? No. Not likely. It would be a good place for a drop. drop. Thank you. Thank you for casually using the term drop. <laughs> cookies is on the show, ladies and gentlemen. It's, Welcome cookies. It's the it's the problem when I start using words like that as though that's like what I always would say or like what just like the average person would say. <sighs> I mean, part of me gets worried about it. And then part of me just goes, it's fine. It's just one of my other personalities coming through. And that's when I should be concerned. Nah, you're oh, fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, listen, there's a lot more to come on this episode, this missing yeah. Queensland episode of True Crime and Cocktails. So let's take a quick break, grab another drink, hit the can, and we'll be right back with more on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Okay, here we go. On three. Yeah. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing uh, missing Queensland, missing persons cases taking place in Queensland, Australia. I was about to try and do an Australian accent, and I saved all of us from the torture. Ah. Christy, back to you. When you say saved all of us, I'm saying uh, you may have stolen something from us. Um... <laughs> Because, I mean, oh, I, I love hearing you do an accent. Um, now, in that last one, I've already done a disclaimer about this, but in that last one, uh, I had about equal information about either one. This uh, section, I'm going to get into four separate cases before we start going thoughts and theories, and some of them significantly less than others. Okay. Again, not by my choosing, by what's out there. Yes. So. We will start uh, on May 8th, 1986. 20-year-old Sharon Phillips ran out of gas, or petrol, if you'd rather, uh, just 10 kilometers or six miles from her home in Wackel. Since the nearest service station was closed, she used a payphone on 
Ipswich Road to call her boyfriend Martin at 11.18 p.m. While on his way, Martin got a flat tire, and by the time he arrived, just after midnight, Sharon was gone. Martin assumed that Sharon must have gotten a ride from someone else. When Sharon didn't arrive at the Peaches and Cream Fruit Market the next morning, her co-workers contacted Sharon's parents. Sharon's father, Bob, went to the place where Sharon was last seen and found Sharon's Nissan Bluebird parked on the side of the road. And for whatever reason, her father decided to drive the car back to the house. Oh, Dad. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, Sharon wasn't reported missing until 8 p.m., 21 hours after she was last heard from. Since Sharon's father moved her car, police were unable to determine whether Sharon had made it back home to her house or not. Police tried to put Sharon's car back in the spot it had originally been abandoned to retrace Sharon's steps, but by then, any potential crime scene had been disturbed. Multiple witnesses claimed to have seen Sharon in the hour before her disappearance, including some soldiers from a nearby army barracks, but no one reported seeing anything suspicious. Five days after Sharon went missing, her shoes and wallet were found just meters away from where the police believe her car had run out of gas. Police had allegedly searched that very area multiple times before the items were discovered. So did the police miss that those items during their search, or did the killer return to the scene and discard the items later on? In 2016, Ian Seeley went to the police to say that his stepfather, Raymond Peter Mulvihill, had confessed to killing Sharon. And it's very common for people to falsely confess in high-profile cases, so when a confession comes decades later, it's kind of hard to believe. Right. But Ian claims on the night of Sharon's disappearance, he picked Raymond up near a payphone on Ipswich Road, which was the usual changeover spot that Raymond used as a taxi driver. Ian noted Raymond's taxi was parked down a nearby dirt, la dirt lane behind a group of shops. According to Ian, Raymond told his son, quote, wait here and keep an eye out for police. Raymond then drove Ian's car around to the taxi Ian said that Sharon was tied up and gagged with tape in the trunk or boot of the taxi and that his father moved Sharon from the boot to Ian's car. Ian claimed his father forced him to drive home at knife point, saying he would kill him if he didn't. When they got home, Raymond dropped Ian off and drove away. Days later, Ian found a pair of shoes and a purse inside the trunk of his car, Realizing the items belonged to Sharon, Ian drove back to Ipswich Road and dumped the items in the field near the payphone. Police believe Sharon may have seen Raymond's taxi and asked for a ride that night. Ugh. Raymond died of cancer in 2002, but Ian claims that before his death, Raymond confessed to dumping Sharon's body in a stormwater drain at Carroll Park. According to police records, on the night of Sharon's disappearance, Ian's car was pulled over by an officer who made a note of a taxi being parked behind the shops shortly before midnight. The police organized a dig at Carroll Park, but didn't find a body. A couple who lived nearby said that that night they drove past the stormwater drain and saw a man coming out of the bushes carrying a shovel. The man walked to a taxi that was parked nearby. All of the doors were open and the interior lights were on. The man was covered in dirt. They asked the man if he was all right, to which the man responded, quote, can't a guy take a shit in peace? <laughs> if you were just taking a shit, why were you covered in dirt, sir? Well, look, absolutely. What I love, though, is that he knew it was a conversation ender. Yeah, great call. Like I've always said, if you tell someone you have diarrhea, they don't ask questions. Like, I'm not being glib. Like, I'm saying yeah. that that, to me, proves even further that he was, like, conniving, you know? 
that's one way to get them to leave without outright People saying aren't... leave. Exactly. 100%. Uh, Ian claims that he asked his father how many girls and his father responded, lots. Oh my God. An inquest into Sharon's disappearance began in 2021. Raymond's sister-in-law admitted Raymond told her about the crime back in 1992. She claims Raymond told her Ian helped dispose of the body. So did Raymond Mulvihill kill Sharon Phillips? And if Ian was telling the truth, why did it take him 14 years to go to the police after his stepfather died? Did he wait because he didn't want to implicate himself because he maybe was more involved than he claimed? I don't know, but I find, I just, I'm not saying I don't believe that Raymond was involved. I'm just saying if he died in 2002, why did it take you over 10 years to suddenly tell the police about it? That to me yeah. doesn't sit well with me. No. But case number four. Deidre Joan Cunningham was born in 1945. She was last seen leaving a house party on Hindley Avenue in Maruchidor in the early hours of June 12th, 1994. She was not familiar with the area and she was traveling on foot. She has not been seen or heard from since. Her bank accounts have not been touched. Deidre was described as a loving mother and friend and a, quote, little dynamite. She drove a 3,500-ton crane for work and was trying to get her pilot's license. I love it. Deidre had just purchased a property at Miriam Vale near Bundaberg, so it's not likely that she chose to walk away from her life. In 1997, during an inquest into Deidre's possible death, everyone who attended the party that night in 1994 was questioned on the stand. The only person who refused to answer any questions was Colin Leonard Rosso, who was Deidre's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance. Here we go. The couple had been together about three months at the time, and to that I say, Colin, why wouldn't you want your girlfriend to be found unless you know where she already is? Mm -hmm. Colin died in August 2011. He was questioned multiple times by police, but was never charged in Deidre's disappearance. No sign of Deidre Cunningham has ever been found. She was 49 at the time of her disappearance. Deidre was described as a Caucasian female. 152 centimeters or four foot nine. I remind you, 3,500 ton crane. Uh, she had a medium build, brown hair and brown eyes. Can I ask one question? Yes. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. My brain blipped. No, no. She was seen leaving the party on foot or attending? Yes. Leaving. Leaving. Yes. Thank you. I have so many questions that I don't have answers for. Like, so he was at the party. How come they left separately? That was, did yeah. he, listen, was I put that in my leaving notes. Leaving her with yeah. her? Like, no, exact. that was exactly oh. where I went. I was like, th that's why I wanted you to clarify. Cause I was like, wait a second. She had a boyfriend who was at the party with her, but she was leaving alone. I must've misheard her. That's what I thought. I thought it was the, that I was like, she must've been gone missing on her way there. No but one no, has no. ever said whether he left with her or not. It was, mm -hmm. she was last seen leaving. I don't know if she was last seen leaving with him. I don't know if they got into a fight at the party and went there. She left and then maybe he caught up with her. I don't know. Interesting. Case number five, Alicia Carrington, better known as Ellie, was born in 1975. She was last seen by family on August 1st, 1997 in the Laidley area. They believe she may have been heading to Darwin, although she was known to frequent Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast areas. While she would often be gone for long periods of time without contacting her family, Ellie always attended important family events, and she has missed several since her disappearance. Ellie was described as a First Nations transgender female, 180 centimeters or five foot nine, 
with a slim build, brown hair, and hazel eyes. She had an Egyptian tattoo on the front of her neck and a red heart tattoo that read mum on her bicep. Ellie was just 22 at the time of her disappearance, and sadly, that is all the information that has ever been released about her. That's a tragedy. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about that as well. Like, was it specifically, have, did the, I mean, I've already shit on the police already once. Uh, <laughs> just, what's it going to hurt to go for it again? Well, um, did they purposely not bother looking into it? Was it a case of like, oh, she often goes for long periods of time. She'll be back. Was it a racist thing about the fact that she was First Nations? Was it homophobic? Was it like there's so many things, transphobic? Yeah, there was so many things about what it could have been as to why they didn't fully look into it. Like, well, yeah, 100 percent. This happened in 1997. How do we not know more by now? I mean, the I Internet was, you know, it was yeah. dial up, but the Internet was usable at that point. So, again, yeah. it, I always think about that when we talk about cases on the show, like where, and I know that's such a funny thing, but seriously, it's like, where were we in terms of internet at the time? Because I feel like the crimes that happened post internet being in everyone's home. Yes. There's typically, obviously not always, but there's typically like more access to information about those cases, I think, unless we're talking about a really prolific, you know, sure. Jack the Ripper or whatever, of you know? Of course. Um, so yeah, I mean that that is a, a complete tragedy, absolutely. And I mean, I I don't think that it's uh, you know, unfortunately, she checked a lot of boxes that we know to this day um, are cases that do not get uh, investigated as they should. So yeah, it's very sad. It's why um, it's why missing episodes came to be exactly. Yeah, because we knew there are going to be so many, and if nothing else. We post the photos of everybody that I can find on our socials in the hopes that their faces out there will do something. Totally. 51-year-old Marion Barter was an elementary school teacher and a mother of two. In 1997, Marion decided she was ready for a change. She had gone through three divorces, and by this point, her children were about 27 and 26 years old. So Marion sold her house in late April, quit her job in late June. Her plan was to take a long-term vacation in England. So on June 22nd, just two days after she quit her job, Marion's friend Leslie dropped her off at a bus station in Surfer's Paradise. As of February 2023, Leslie was the last of Marion's friends and family to have seen her. Marion sent her friends, family, and former students letters, postcards, and gifts. She called her daughter Sally in late July, saying she was having a great time in Tunbridge Wells, Kent. Marion last spoke with her daughter on the evening of August 1st, when Marion told Sally she was having such a good time that she was going to extend her stay. When Marion failed to call her son on his birthday in October, the family knew that something was wrong. So Sally called Marion's bank, and they told her that every day for three weeks between August and September, someone entered various bank branches in Byron Bay and on the Gold Coast and withdrew 5000 Australian dollars from Marion's account. A separate transfer of 80000 Australian dollars was made October 15th. Sally went to some of the branches with her with a photo of her mother, but none of the employees remembered ever seeing her. On October 22nd, 1997, Sally contacted the police to report her mother missing. But police believe that Marion wanted to disappear, so her name wasn't added to the missing persons list. When a Queensland senior constable contacted Marion's bank, a bank teller said that Marion had withdrawn all her money and did not want her whereabouts disclosed. Quote, the teller was just so insistent that it was definitely her, and there was no other way about it. Also, to the best of my knowledge, the teller didn't know Marion personally. So, yeah. Anyhow. 
In a coronial inquest in June 2021, it came out that a month before she left Australia, Marion legally changed her name to Florabella Natalia Marion Romeco. She got a passport under her new name and didn't tell any of her family or friends about this name change. Also without anyone knowing, Marion returned to Australia on August 2nd, the day after she spoke to her daughter about extending her trip. Her immigration card claimed she was married, living in Luxembourg as a housewife, and that she would only be staying in Australia for three days. Sally verified the handwriting on the card, saying it was in fact Marion's. Marion used her Medicare card in Grafton, New South Wales on August 13th. The card was never used again, and her passport never left the country. Without seeing or speaking with Marion personally, police concluded that Marion was alive and just simply didn't want to be contacted. Private investigators searched the name Remakel in online archives and found a newspaper ad in a French-Australian newspaper from 1994 placed by a 47-year-old man looking for a relationship. The man described himself as single, tall, dark, sober, non-smoker. The ad was signed F. Remakel with a P.O. box and phone number from Lennox Head, New South Wales, less than two hours from where Marion lived at the time. F. Remakel turned out to be a man named Rick Blum. It's spelt Blum. It could be pronounced Bloom, but he seems like kind of a dick, so I'm going to say Blum in the hopes that it's wrong. I like that. Mr. Blum emigrated to Australia in 1976 and has since changed his name at least 13 times. Whoa! He was born Willie Woters, but to spare any confusion, I, I'll just call him Rick. Makes it easier. He said, quote, I just changed my name as a fantasy because it's legal. I didn't have any specific purpose. Rick said he got the name Remakel from his ex-wife, Monique Cornelius. Despite the fact that Rick and Monique had once been married, Rick said their relationship was strictly platonic. But a letter was found that Rick had written to Monique in 1980 when he was living in Luxembourg. The letter starts, quote, My enchantress, I have never in my life made love like that with anyone before. Monique said they absolutely had a sexual relationship, and it ended when she discovered that Rick was married with children. She described Rick as a liar and a dangerous manipulator, but if you ask Rick, he said Monique was the liar. Then there's Janet Oldenburg, who said she took a trip with Rick, who went by the name Rick West at the time. She said they met in 1996, reconnected in 1999, when Rick confessed feelings for Janet and suggested she move with him to the French Riviera to start a new life. He claimed his coin business was worth 12 million Australian dollars and that he owned 20,000 acres of property. Rick told Janet to bury her jewelry in her garden and join him in the UK. Once she was there, Rick called Janet to say he'd been robbed and beaten by six men with baseball bats. He suffered two broken ribs and was in the hospital in northern France. He told her he'd book a flight back to Australia on December 29th. Well, Janet booked a flight home December 20th. And when Rick showed up at her house, he was surprised to see her there. <sighs> and she was surprised to see that Rick was not injured in any way. Oh, in January boy. 2000, Janet told police that she realized some of her important documents were missing, as was the jewelry she had buried in her garden. When Janet confronted Rick about it, he said he'd return it, but not everything got returned. Rick said he never once told Janet he, that he'd moved to Europe with her because Janet's a liar. Oh, sure. 
Rick said he left the UK because he didn't want to deal with her anymore and because his life was with his wife and children in Australia. Gross. A woman named Jeanette Gaffney Bowen said in the late 90s she placed an ad seeking friendship, which was answered by Rick, who told her his name was Frederick de Hedververy? Hedververy? Rick suggested that Jeanette sell her house and buy an apartment in Paris. When she refused, he tried to blackmail her with naked photos he had taken of her without her consent. Jeanette became scared of Rick to the point where she took out a restraining order against him in 1998. She said he was only ever after her money, and she had given him 30000 Australian dollars as a Oof. startup for his new business. No. <laughs> Rick denies it all because... Say it with me, everyone at home. Jeanette is the liar. <laughs> There's a real pattern of behavior here, and it's... I almost appreciate how on... Like, he's sticking to his script, you know? Yep. He found something that worked for him, and he just stuck to it, the prick. There she yep. is. So during a 2021 inquest, Rick admitted he had a four-month-long affair with Marion Barter from February to June 1997. Marion responded to his ad. They met three or four times at Marion's home without Rick's wife's knowledge. Rick claims their relationship ended before Marion left the country. However, it was pointed out, Rick traveled to Europe on June 17th, just five days before Marion. Then he returned to Australia on July 31st, just two days before Marilyn returned. Marion, sorry, returned. Rick claims it was a coincidence and he's not involved in any way in Marion's disappearance. And if Marion was around, he would probably have called her a liar. Yeah. I'm just allegedly. Uh-huh. So is it possible that Marion is living a quiet life and purposely avoiding her family and friends? Sure. In the grand scheme of anything being possible. But I find it strange she didn't contact her family in 1998 when her daughter got married. Or in 2001, when her first grandchild was born. Or in 2003, when her son died. And while it's possible that Marion walked away from her family with zero contact, I'm more likely to believe that something more sinister happened to Marion, especially with her connection to Rick Blum. Rick told women he had a coin-dealing business worth millions, when in reality, he was living on a disability pension with his wife and two children. Also something the women didn't know was Rick had criminal convictions in France and Belgium for fraud and forgery. Rick admitted to the affairs but denied any other wrongdoing. But I, of course, do not trust Rick. In any way. No. As of February 2023, Marion Barter has never been found. She was described as a Caucasian female, 167 centimeters or 5'4", with a slim build, dark hair, and green or hazel eyes. Wowzer. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and do these in order. Yeah. Because I got a lot to say about Rick Blum. Oh, fucking Rick. Uh, okay, Sharon Phillips, the first one that we came in with here. I have so many questions. Yeah, It feels, again, given what we know now, given the witness statements that said that they had seen the cab in the area, et cetera, and given the story that Ian has, has given, yep, we're obviously alleging and speculating, but it feels very plausible that this Raymond character had some connection to this disappearance. Yep. Why... Why Raymond waited 14 years after he died? My question is, is there a statute of limitations on murder in Australia? Oh, great call. Was he waiting that out? Because the crime happened in 1986. That's an odd amount of time. Oh, no, 1986, so it was 2016. 2016 he went. Yeah. So that would have been 30 years, right? Was that math, right? 86 just 2016 yeah yeah 96 
2006. Six. There we go. 30 years. My yeah. question is, is there a statute of limitations on murder that he was waiting to run out? Interesting. Or is there a statute of limitations on sexual assault? Sure. I feel like that's the first nugget there. Because why why else go to the police at all? Right? But yeah. the answer is sometimes people have guilty consciences. And that says to me more than anything, he might have been involved. Not sure. to potentially from the get. But that feels to me like, again, psychologist hat on. He felt compelled to go to the police because he carries a guilt. Right? Sure. And it may be as simple as he did help transport the body and, and his involvement ends there. But it just seems to me like that would be my first thing I would research. Yeah, that makes sense to me. You know, um, my next comment is Raymond's sister-in-law said that he did this murder and Ian helped dump the body in 1990. Why didn't, was she living in fear of her brother-in-law? Like, why, why did it take? She her... say something in 1982. Yeah, in 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 2002 when he died. That as well. Yeah. Like, I get that it's like okay. I mean, look, I, holding secrets like that for people is pretty extreme. Um, but I can understand feeling, you know, fear. But again, why did it take her so long to come forward? Yeah. Yeah, great point. I mean, interesting family. Um <clears throat> Deidre Cunningham, Little Dynamite, I love that. I love everything about her vibe. Um don't love this story though, obviously. Um yeah, the fact that the only person who gave pushback that was at the party was this boyfriend, the oh. fact that you know, if we know anything, again, we have we haven't been doing this long enough, but we have been doing it long enough to know, typically, statistically, it's a partner. I also think, and this is me psychologist hatting for a second, it's interesting that they had been together for three months. And I know what you're thinking, Lauren, why on earth did that have anything to do with anything? I do think, now, don't quote me here because I'm, I can't remember my source, but I feel like I remember reading something once about the three month mark in dating someone sure. is when things start to shift. Um, like okay. chemically in our brains, it's it, I'll, again, I'll have to look this up, but if what I am remembering is correct, it's interesting. Cause this could be, that's kind of like statistically or, or whatever. Um, the time where you start to like see the real other person or there can be cracks that you see or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's just sure. interesting to me, that timeline. Um, yeah, I would love to know why a four foot nine. Now, listen, I'm not saying that, you know, any woman, whatever, but, but like you were okay with your physically tiny girlfriend walking home alone in the middle of the night, especially in an area she wasn't familiar with. It feels to me like there was an argument. She stormed off. He went after her. Things escalated. and Right? Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, it's completely possible also that it was a random, you know, kidnapping or maybe she someone offered her a ride and she took it. Those things are also possible. But why else, again, would he not just admit that at some point? That they got into a fight, he let her go home, and he feels guilty about it, you know? Oh, 100%. Um, Alicia, as we said, very sad that there's not more information out there about her and her case. Again, feels like racism and transphobia feel like they could absolutely be why the case was not given more um, thought and investigation like it deserved. Um, all right, Marion. Now, is this story a documentary or a movie of some kind? Because it's crying out for it. I think someone did make it. I think there is an Australian podcast about it. Right. But of course, as you know, I don't listen to other podcasts. Of course. When researching the show, but 
I think there is something, but it's, it's wild. I, you could easily, Rick is like a, is almost like the widower. Yes. Except the majority of the women are survived. Right. Right. Well, here's the other thing I was going to say. First of all, he's got a pattern. Oh yeah. So that's the first reason why I'm debunking the police's theory that she just wanted to disappear. This man has a pattern. He does. And the other reason I debunk that th theory is that she was still calling her children around the time she went missing. Yep. If she had flown away to the UK and they never heard from her again, I would still be suspicious, but I can understand that theory a little bit better. But she didn't. She may have. And the other thing I would say is I don't understand why the police would just be happy to wash their hands and say, ah, she just doesn't want to be found. When also it's to me, she's the victim of a scam gone wrong, but also on the surface, she could have been having a mental health issue. She's secretly changed yeah. her name and got a new passport without telling her family. She's lied about where she is in the world. To me, isn't that aren't those two things enough for the police to go? Maybe we should look at this. Maybe she wasn't in her right state of mind. Yeah. Yeah, I call, agree. Call me crazy. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, 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 yeah, I don't know. That one really, I mean, again, it's riveting. It fascinated me, but it just feels like that's a real tragedy that it just got brushed off like that. Cause there's no way that this woman just wanted to disappear. I don't buy it. It feels like no. this man is a master manipulator. Yes. He convinced, he convinced, we know he convinced other women, for example, um, like Janet, he convinced her to bury her jewelry in the garden, tell him where it is. And then obviously went and got it. He very clearly went back. Yep. I'm, it was, he was surprised to see her at the house. I wonder if she caught him at her house. Probably. And then was like, hey, sir, how about not? I also like his relationship with Monique. They were married. He was like, it was platonic. We didn't do a thing. And then sent her a letter where it was like, I've never been fucked like that before. <laughs> so it's like, sir. Yeah. You can't. You no. can't claim one thing when you know it's written out and it's there. Also, the fact that his defense of every single woman is she's a liar. I know. Where are you, sir? Are the one who claimed to have this millions of dollar worth of business when you were on a pension, which is not millions of dollars or your own no. business. Also, didn't tell any of these women he was already married. Didn't tell them he had kids. Always just big lies with him. But the women were the ones who were the liars. He also claimed to get badly beaten and yes. then had no. Had no injuries at all. Yeah. Uh, one thing about him that stands out, I mean, so many things stand out to me, but it was his specific quote about changing his name. Um, when it, he's, he's changed it legally 13 separate times. And he says he changes it as a fantasy. His use of fantasy, it's like, because your life is sad and boring for you. You wanted more from life than what you got. And so you're like, I'm going to change my name and become another person. Whereas, I mean, I do that on the show for free um, and not <laughs> legally. But, you know, like. But also bullshit. I, I agree with you. I think his his word, his use of the word fantasy, I think, is is fascinating. I agree with you. But he's also doing it to scam women. A hundred percent. Like it's, it's like that's the only reason you're doing it, man. But yeah, his use of fantasy from a psychologist at point of view, fascinating because you're right. It's like you're, it, it's almost like a detachment from what he's doing to the women. Yeah. Right. Like a disassociation that it's like, I am creating these different stories for myself because my life is boring and pathetic. Um, and then in doing so also it helps me take their money. I think what's wild to me too is like how easily or I shouldn't say easily because I don't know how 
uh, ad- adept he is at making these women, convincing these women to do these things. Because I don't know that Marion was like jumping to change her name and keep it a secret from her family. I don't know that she was like jumping to write her own fantasy story, that she was a woman living in Lux- Luxembourg, Berg, et cetera. Um, you know? But then yeah. I also... The other thing that did I did clock was that it was like she had a lot of money. Yeah, she teacher. had also just sold her house. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That would that would be. I was like, how does she have that much money for a teacher? But that makes sense. But yeah. again, for for someone to be able to go in every day for months and take out five thousand dollars a day, and then there was also an eighty thousand dollar transfer. That's a chunk of savings. So yeah. you're right. That makes sense. It would probably have come from the house. But to that, I say. Who was coming in and taking out the money? Was it a woman or was it a man? Is And then to that I say, is Rick's wife in on this? Interesting. Did his wife go in and make those withdrawals? Because he needed a woman. Or is this a the jinx situation and was he going in dressed as a woman? Interesting. I mean, oh, I'm convinced... Absolutely, it's him. I'm also convinced he probably wasn't sharing that money with his wife because how else is he going to afford to fly to all these places to claim to these women that he has tons of money? I agree. But the only reason why I'm like, is it possible? Because his MO changed because she's gone. So likely he killed her, right? Oh, yeah. So... Is is in his MO changing? Did the wife find out? What about this? Did she show up? Did she find out about something? She shows up somewhere to confront the wife. Was Marion like, you know what I mean? Like, is did something happen in that world? And then that was why he had to um potentially take her out, for lack of a better term. And then also the wife's in on it. And it's like, well, yeah, I did this thing, but now we can get all this money if you play ball. I mean, that's possible. I mean, you. I want to know. I mean, I also have the question, um, which unfortunately I don't have the answer of, which is why I did not provide the answer already. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marion, I mean, had come back to the country without telling her family and her Medicare card was used... 11 days after she got to the country when she said on her immigration card she's only staying for three days my question is what happened to her that she needed that medicare card good question did something like terrible happen to her and she was injured and ended up at the hospital but then where did she go after that or was she already dead and again his wife potentially posed as her to go use the Medicare card. Sure. Make it seem like she's still alive. That is possible. I'd love to know how similar his wife was to her. Like physically. Physically. Yeah. I have not seen a photo of his wife, but I also Like, is his wife still with him? Because it is very public knowledge now after the inquest into Marion. It's very public that he had so many affairs. But he could potentially be with him. But if he's this good a manipulator and I'm going to guess abusive and toxic, the two things tend to go hand in hand. Of course. Is it possible that he's convincing her that these women are all crazy Because I've seen this in other kind of scam scenarios where the the scammer, when it's typically a man doing this kind of thing, will manage to convince his partner that they're all crazy and he's the victim. Oh, I could absolutely see that. And listen, I have compassion for that that woman, potentially, um, if what we're, you know, the story we're writing is correct. Because when you've lived with someone who is that much of a master manipulator for that long, you've been being gaslit your entire relationship. Yep. In many ways, I'm sure it's easier to just believe him. 
You know, it's it's like when you hear about people in cults, people who've who've, you know, gotten into to a cult situation and you live in it long enough that it's like you just believe the person. You know, sometimes yeah. people forever, sometimes people get out of it. But you know what I'm saying? Like it was yeah, it's just fascinating to me. And again, this is crying for for some sort of like um like a fictionalized version of this story like it's wild right? yeah yeah oh i would love to just i just want to know more about every relationship rick's ever had hell yeah platonic or not i want to know it as parents i want to know about all of it rick yep. write a book and then you don't even have to manipulate me i'll buy it <laughs> stop drilling you've hit oil 100 um this also reminds me of a great documentary called Love Fraud, which if people have not seen, I highly recommend about a gentleman who did, has a very similar kind of story, scamming women. Um, and again, there's examples in that too of, of you know, him saying all these women are crazy and I'm, I'm, I'm a victim. And then sometimes some people believe that, which again, wild stuff. Um, but listen, there's more. This isn't over yet. It wasn't over for me. It was, it was never, never over. over. Uh, we're going to take one more break, hit the can, grab another break, and then uh, another drink, rather, and then we're going to come on back with more unsolved missing cases on the missing Queensland episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right. Clap three. One, two, three. Welcome back to True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing missing Queensland, unsolved missing persons cases. What you got for us now? Oh, well, last time, last section of break, uh, I had four cases for us. Mm -hmm. This final section, I got five. So we're going to have uh, lots of things. I also tried to find a variety in age and all of that for the hopes of branching it out. Because, of course, there's so many. Yes. How do you narrow it down? And I'm going to say it. It's it's not easy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't bet. know why I've done this to myself. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was uh, this was done voluntarily. So, <laughs> case number seven of the day: Rachel Joy Antonio was dropped off at a movie theater in Bowen around 6 p.m. on April 25th, 1998. When she didn't return home later that evening, her parents reported her missing. Rachel has not been seen or heard from since. Turns out, though, that Rachel didn't actually go to the movies at all. She walked about 500 meters to Queens Beach and sat in the lifeguard chair. When two men questioned her sitting there, Rachel said she was waiting for her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. That same night, lifeguard Robert Heitch, Heitch there we go, uh, was at his brother's 18th birthday party. Shortly after 7 p.m., Robert went to rent a movie for the younger kids at the party and to pick up some ice. He left the house wearing a T-shirt, shorts, and sandals, or flip-flops. When he returned home 45 minutes later, he didn't have any ice. He was also missing his shirt. Robert claimed his car had broken down and he used his shirt to clean up the grease. Tiny drops of Rachel's blood were later found on Robert's sandal, but Rachel's body was never found. In December 1998, Robert was charged with Rachel's murder. He denied any involvement. Shortly after her disappearance, a secret diary owned by Rachel was found. One entry read, quote, Robert and I have been best friends for over two years and have been going out for six months. I can honestly say that I love him. Robert, of course, denies any relationship with Rachel because he knows it was illegal as Robert was 25 at oh. the time and Rachel was just 16. Keep in mind, she said they'd been friends for over two years. What 23-year-old man wants to be just friends with a 14-year-old girl? Someone who's waiting for her to turn 16 because it was probably the age of consent? I could see that. Absolutely. Gross. Gross. Yep. In an entry written in late 1997, 
Rachel said she was scared her boyfriend would break up with her if she didn't sleep with him. Quote, the biggest issue I have in my life right now is whether to do it or not. The diary, en diary entries were deemed inadmissible in court. And in November 1999, Robert was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to nine years in prison. He appealed in May 2000, and in June 2001, he was granted a retrial and was eventually acquitted. In July 2016, during a coronial inquest into Rachel's suspected death, a coroner found that Robert did, in fact, have an intimate relationship with Rachel and believed that Robert fatally injured Rachel and hid her body. However, without out of body, the coroner was unable to determine the exact cause of Rachel's death or the location as to where her body may be. In 2019, police launched a new investigation to determine whether Robert could be charged with perjury for denying his relationship with Rachel. Rachel Antonia was 16 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 165 centimeters or 5'4", with a slim build, brown hair, and hazel eyes. Then we have Stephen James Goldsmith, born 1972 in the UK. He worked as an arborist in Toowoomba. He was last seen on July 10th, 2000 on CCTV footage at a Commonwealth Bank ATM in the Brisbane suburb of New Farm. When friends had not heard from Stephen in several days, they reported him missing on July 29th. His beige Mitsubishi Sigma station wagon was found containing his work tools parked outside of his flat on Sydney Street. His car keys, passport, and driver's license were all found inside the house. There was also a load of laundry in the dryer. The only thing that appeared to be missing was Stephen's credit card. It is not believed that Stephen just took off to start a new life as he was in constant contact with his family in the UK. There was also no record of him leaving the country. Stephen also had some plans coming up that he was really excited about. So police believe Stephen died on or around July 10th. Stephen withdrew $3,000 from the ATM he was last seen at and deposited that money into his MasterCard account. Uh, police believe that maybe the amount of money he had is what may have led to his death. At an inquest into Stephen's case in 2007, it was determined that Stephen was likely dead. An anonymous caller contacted police for years, providing information about what happened to Stephen, the same person called multiple times over the years, but was last heard from in 2006. Police have made several public pleas asking that caller to reach out again. Stephen Goldsmith was 28 at the time of his disappearance. He was described as a Caucasian male, 175 centimeters or 5'7", medium build with red hair, freckles, and brown eyes. He had tattoos on both upper arms, including a skull with a top hat, and Jessica Rabbit. I recently just watched Who Frame Roger Rabbit again. Uh, he also had a tattoo of an eagle on his shoulder blade. He walked with a slight limp due to a work injury from 1997. There is currently a $250,000 reward for information on Stephen's disappearance. Then we have Allison Naradine Bernard who was born in 1989 in Koenyama. I read an article where her family requested she only be referred to by her surname. So I will refer to her as Miss Bernard from here on out. I've also seen articles since then interviewing her family about her where her name is said. But I will stick with Miss Bernard just to be safe. Okay. Miss, Miss Bernard <clears throat> was on her way home from Archer River. Three days after she was supposed to arrive, her family reported her missing on February 13th, 2013. The next day, police did an extensive land and aerial search, but Miss Bernard was not found. Miss Bernard was last seen February 10th on CCTV footage at a pub at the Cohen Exchange Hotel 
with quarry caretaker Thomas Burns. When he was first questioned by police, Thomas said, quote, I haven't done anything with her. I haven't murdered her or anything else. Which is incredibly suspicious, Thomas. Yeah. He also had scratches and marks on his arms and chest, which he claimed he got from work. Mm -hmm. Police took photos of the injuries, but didn't swab the scratches for DNA. Wonderful. Police also didn't take any fingernail scrapings from Thomas. And while we're talking about a lack of police work, uh, police didn't fully search Thomas's house. However, small amounts of blood were found on a towel in his home. He claimed the blood was his. Uh, so they just took his word for it, never tested it. Wonderful. Uh, it was described as a very small amount of blood and not a life-threatening amount is how it was specifically described. So I guess they were like, it's small enough. I'm sure it's nothing. And they let it go. Mm. There are multiple mine shafts and caves near the house, uh, which were not checked. Police didn't even attempt to look for any witnesses. It was also found that Miss Bernard made a phone call from Thomas's house to a relative cell phone. The call lasted several minutes, but police didn't follow up who Miss Bernard spoke to or what they spoke about. Police also didn't look into Thomas's background, such as his assault charge in 1995 for attempting to strangle a man. And since Miss Bernard's disappearance, multiple witnesses have claimed that Thomas has allegedly threatened them, saying things like, quote, I put things like you in the ground and, quote, watch yourselves or I'll bury you next to that girl and no one will find you. A big thing that makes Thomas seem suspect is the fact that he had conflicting stories about what happened with Miss Bernard. First, he said he picked her up on the side of the road near Archer River late at night and took her back to his house near the quarry. Again, just want to point out, then how are you seen on CCTV footage with her at a bar if you found her on the side of the road and took her home? Yep. Okay. Ah. Uh, then he said, he said Miss Bernard was so intoxicated that she urinated in her clothes. So he took her clothes to wash them and she ran off into a nearby bush. Thing is, a caretaker that lived in that very quarry house shortly after Thomas said the washing machine there didn't work. Yeah. And when Thomas gave Miss Bernard's clothes to the police, they didn't test them any in any way to determine if there was urine. I don't know if there is such a test, but I'm sure there's something that they could have done to determine if urine was there. Uh, police searched the quarry, but found no trace of Miss Bernard. Thomas later told police he met Miss Bernard at a pub. Then he claimed she had stolen his car. In 2017, Miss Bernard's case was determined to be a likely homicide. No sign of Miss Bernard has ever been found. At the time of her disappearance, she was 23 years old and a mother of two. She was described as an indigenous female, 155 centimeters or five feet, with a slim build, brown hair, and brown eyes. It doesn't get any less frustrating. Oh, that that one just killed me. <laughs> I'm just like, there's yeah. so much there. It's like, oh my God. Yep. Ugh. I, oh, I, yeah, I, I have thoughts. I yep. have thoughts. Uh, Reese, Reese Kearney was born in 1991 after attending the funeral of a close friend on December 15th, 2017, Reese returned to the, to the home he shared with his parents in Gillatin. He was said to be distressed and agitated. He allegedly smashed his phone and left with nothing but the clothes on his back. Reese's mother returned home and found that her black 2012 Bonneville Triumph motorcycle and Reese were both missing. His family reported him missing that same day. His parents believed that Reese might have been heading to see his brother in Normanton. However, he didn't make it. He was last seen on December 21st, filling up the motorcycle at a roadhouse in Charters Towers, which is over 1,100 kilometers or 723 miles south of Gillatin. At some point, 
Reese accessed his bank accounts, withdrawing $3,000 in Atherton. In mid-January, Reese was seen on CCTV footage in multiple places in Ravenshoe, about 140 kilometers or, 40, or 87 miles south of Gillotin. I find it interesting that he drove so far south only to double back and almost head home. Then it seems Reese changed his mind and headed in the direction of Normanton. As of February 8th, the motorcycle was found at the Telestra Tower, about 20 kilometers or 12 miles east of Georgetown. Now, Ravenshoe and Normantown are like 563 kilometers, 350 miles apart. Georgetown is almost halfway in between. Uh, so it seems logical that Reese was headed to Normantown. A week after the bike was found, police found a few items of clothing belonging to Reese in bushland near Georgetown, but Reese was nowhere to be found. Reese Kearney was 26 at the time of his disappearance. He was described as a Caucasian male, 172 centimeters or 5'6", with a slim build, light brown hair, and hazel eyes. He has a tattoo on the inside of his right arm that reads, Life Goes On. And our final case up for discussion of the day. Trye Olson was last seen in security camera footage at a Newtown gas station on Bridge Street, Toowoomba, around 1 a.m. on February 17th, 2022. She was filling her silver 2007 Mazda hatchback. Trye was also seen on camera having a heated discussion with a man who she had some sort of minor driving incident with right before getting to the gas station. I do not know what that minor incident was or if the man simply followed her to the gas station or if he was also getting gas. Right. Around 9 a.m. the next morning, Trye's car was found abandoned and wedged in a ditch on a bush track on Gittins Road near Withcott. Trye was not known to travel in that area and her family said it is out of character for her not to be in contact. Police did a major search in the bush area near Trai's car, including search and rescue crews and drones. Some of Trai's personal items, like toiletries, were found, but Trai was nowhere to be found. Police appealed for anyone who lives in the area and may have seen something to come forward. Police also publicly urged the driver of a red ute um, seen with its hood or bonnet up near Green Gully Road around the time of her disappearance to come forward. From what I can tell, police have not yet identified this driver. And to clarify for the non-Australian uh, listeners, a ute is a term for in Australia and New Zealand to describe a vehicle that has trunk space that's like right behind the passenger compartment. So mostly like a pickup sort of situation. Right. Did the driver that Trye had an argument with follow her and run her off the road? Did she escape from him running into the bush and maybe throwing her purse or items of from her purse at him? Is that why they found her toiletries spread throughout the bush? Trye Olson was 50 years old at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 165 centimeters or 5'4" with a slight build, black hair, and brown eyes. If anyone listening has any information on any of cases, the cases that were mentioned today, I will implore them to call Crime Stoppers at 1800-333-000. Looking to bring families closure, I'm Christy Oxborough. Beautiful work. <clears throat> As always. All right, doubling back to Rachel Antonio. Yeah. Ugh. I know. The fact that that man had her blood on her shoes, not yeah. wearing a shirt, was 25, she was 16, had been talking to her since she was 14. Yeah. I can't believe that they didn't allow the diaries to be in... in um 
admissible in court. Yeah. Surely they could, if it was about the fact, like, if there's some kind of theory that she didn't actually write them, surely you can have a handwriting expert testify that it was her handwriting. Sure. I'm assuming, I of course don't know for sure. I fully agree with you. I absolutely think that should be, especially if she can't speak for herself, I think they should be allowed in. I assume it's something where it's considered hearsay. Right. Because just because, I mean, the things I wrote in my diary, I mean, I guess I would have been about 13 at the time. But to that, I say, if she was alive and this was like a trial of about an attack, it's almost as good as her speaking for herself. Well, especially when we're talking about a secret relationship. Oh, yeah. It was you know, also suggested that he may have impregnated another girl and that out of jealousy, she claimed she was pregnant to try and, like, get him back. So I just feel like that, to me, let the let the diary stand. Well, it's interesting because they still charged him. Like, he still was found guilty of manslaughter, even though... I mean, that's a tough charge to have stick given no body. Yeah. But then just as quickly as he was charged with it, they acquitted him. Right. Which I is... don't get it. Oh, no, I don't either. He does claim to be innocent. So we are not saying anything until, you know, bodies are found. I will just never, I mean, maybe I'm too naive for this job. But I will never, ever fully comprehend how do you completely hide a body? And if, yeah. it, if it was him, which I lean towards, allegedly, um, how do you do it in the 45 minutes? Like 45 did he minutes put her somewhere and then circle back later to put her somewhere else? Was it as simple as she went into a dumpster and got put? taken to a dump and never found yeah it's and a great question did you claim you threw that shirt out because it was covered in grease where'd you throw it out where's the shirt well yeah and also did they search his car did they test his car because to me, the most likely scenario is he goes, meets her, says, get in the car, and then something happened in the car. Oh. And either she was in the trunk overnight or sure. and then could have been moved at any point, uh, which is also buying him time, right? Because it is a short period of time. Right. So, I, I mean, again, I'm completely speculating here. But, I mean, that's... I mean, anytime you have something like a secret relationship with an adult man and a child, yeah. it just feels like, you know, the credibility of the adult man isn't great. Um, and that's not me saying that it's like, that's proof enough he killed her. I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm saying is, is that it's like, you know, nothing would surprise me. Let's put it that way. Oh, no. He also, to this day, as best I know, uh, continues to deny that they were ever a couple. Right. Well, then what's, they were just friends? Even that, it's like, no. I There, not a chance, there is not a 20, early 20s man who has anything genuinely in common with a 14 to 16 year old girl. That's like, you know what? We are such soulmates that I need to continue speaking with this girl. And again, it's like the idea that it's like, we were never romantically involved. We were just friends. It's like, you still made a poor judgment call. You yes. still have no credibility. Even if that was true, which we both know it, I'm certain was not. Yeah. You made a poor judgment call by being friends with a child. There's absolutely no reason to be, there's no reason to be doing that as an adult. Stop it. Stop it's a it. terrible I it's a terrible choice regardless, you know. Um Even Stephen if you Gold don't care about her safety. Be selfish then. Think about that's what your I'm own saying. safety. Yep. 
and just be like, you know what? This can't lead anywhere good. Back out? No. I just don't know what... Yeah, what is your motive other than... Like, what is your motive? Yeah. For being friends with a child. Like, it's silly. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Um, Stephen Goldsmith. That's an interesting one. Because I'm curious about motive there. Yeah. Doesn't feel I like mean... he's... He's the only thing I can think is that because his family was so far away, that can sometimes make you a target. Sure. Right. That it's like if you don't have a large, necessarily like circle of close people physically near you, of course, where where am I drawing this from? Hit Hulu film fresh. <laughs> Starring. <laughs> The one and only uh, Sebastian Stan. Oh, um, that that was, oh God, that was a new level of not hyper enunciation, but like there was like a like a sexy stank to it. A Stan, like Stan. I like that. Yeah, I like thank that. you for sexy stank. <laughs> I've been using stank a lot a lately. A lot, a, a Ever lot. Ever since Rihanna. Yep. Rihanna's thing. For some reason, I like, and I mean stank in the best possible way. Like, of course, like just dirty, like in it, like Rihanna, that performance lady. I was in it. I'm still in it. Listen, we all are. Um, but yeah, there just doesn't feel like this is one of the cases where I would say I would buy that it was a crime of. Um, oh God, my, my, I'm losing language. Passion. Opportunity, opportunity oh, sure. or, or an acquaintance or a stranger. Because again, I'm sure. like, what other, what else was going on? Unless again, there's a layer to this we don't know about, but, but it just feels like this is just like an average dude. Um, so unless he had ties to something illegal that we don't know about, I just am like, what other motive is there? Yeah. Potentially kill him. And it doesn't feel like he was trying to start his life over either. No. Yeah. Now, Allison Bernard, this is the one that broke me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, truly. I mean, listen, I thought that I thought that the Rachel Antonio one was hard to, to top and not that it's topping it, but just in terms of my losing my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the number one thing I have to say. I don't know what the day-to-day -day specifications of a job are for a quarry caretaker. Sure. But I'm guessing that it's physical. Sure. I'm guessing that you are working, caretaking around the quarry. That right? makes sense. The suggestion that he would have scratches in his arms and chest, on his arms and chest, saying he got them at work. What's your work uniform? Where are these police? It's just such an easy A to B to me. Because I'm going to guess, not across the board, but there's a pretty large chance he probably wears long sleeves if he has a physically demanding job. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, could be wrong. It was February. Now, I know that the seasons are different in Australia than yes. they are in North America. So maybe it was warm enough that he would have had short sleeves on. But why is your chest exposed? What are you getting scratched? How are you getting scratches on your chest? Mm -hmm. From what? You mean, you are you working shirtless? Don't find that easy to believe. Sure. Especially if you saw photos of him. Not necessary. Got it. But this again proves my point that I'm like, that's, but I think that that's the thing for me when we, when we, we hear it so often on this show. And these are the things that I always get stuck on. I'm like, there's always a detail to me that if I was the detective, first of all, God, what a dream of a life. But secondly, um, I'm just like, that's where you start. Like, there's always something in these unsolved cases that makes me want to slam my head into a wall because I'm like, that just feels like an easy, an obvious starting point. Right. You have scratches that look like defensive wounds. My next question is, 
What were you wearing to work in the last few days? Yeah. Show me the clothes. What's your uniform? Yeah. Sorry. I would also like to uh, clarify when I say that, uh, when I outright basically said he should not have been topless, um, he's an older gentleman. Sure. And uh, I'm just so convinced he's somehow involved that I, I've got a bit of an ick factor as far as this gentleman goes. Got it. So I and to be not... clear, all bodies yeah. are beautiful. And, and if you want to take your shirt off, God bless all of you. I think Good that that's for you. Yep. We, that's but not that. This is scratches on you after a woman has gone missing after last being seen at your home. Yeah. I'm going to have a lot of questions for you. And it doesn't also... seem like being an older gentleman, like you're saying, being, being a certain type of gentleman, it doesn't feel like this is somebody who's ripping his shirt off to go to work every day. Like that doesn't feel, no. you know, yeah. I also I want to know, did he offer up her clothes to police or did they find her clothes and he gave an excuse as to how they were there? How also, on earth? She Does ran this... naked from the house? And even if this is true, yep. what police detective is going, oh, she peed on herself and you offered to wash the clothes. That makes sense. That's not normal. That's not normal human behavior because guess what else? There's let's say for a second, she did pee on herself. Sure. Was it because she was being attacked? Was it because, was it out of fear? Is there another reason why? Or is it that you kept the clothes as a trophy? Because I tend to believe that. Oh yeah. The fact also, that this man was in the yeah. possession of this dead, or I shouldn't say dead, but this, this missing woman's, Clothing. Yep. The last thing that any admitted. How is this case unsolved? It's baffling because also they claimed he he claimed specifically that she was so drunk they could easily have gone to like talk to the people who actually served her and be like, how much did she drink? How and much? I want to well, know, who did she call? Did she speak to somebody? Like it, it was long enough. She very clearly spoke to somebody. Here's another question I have for you. Yeah. Yes to all of that. Building on that, if you saw her on CCTV footage, then you'd be able to put together probably a rough timeline of how she, long she was there, and without even interviewing witnesses. To your point, you could already determine. All right. Well, what? How much have we seen her drink on this footage? How long was she there? Yep. They're probably going to know if she was there for twenty minutes or or three hours. Yep. That's basic. Oh, a hundred percent. And I don't mean to throw this in it again, but there's a part of me that's like, is it just? Did they not pay as much attention or care as much for racist reasons? Was she indigenous as well? She was. Hmm. Yep. Just to me, she was last known to be in his home. He even admitted she was there. There was blood found on a towel and her clothes were there. And they went, this, there's a reasonable explanation for that. And also, he also his is story, he, he took the clothes to wash them. And then she just ran into the bush, like, carefree. Did she take off to get away from you? Like, just none and of And he it changed his sense. story, too, right? Like, he originally said he was driving her home, right? Oh, he claimed he met her walking on a road, and he offered her a ride and took her to his place. Then he admitted he did meet her at the bar before driving her to his place. And then at some point he did claim uh, he took her back to his place and st or at, when they met at the bar, she stole his car. Was but, the car searched? But somehow he got the car back and then they went to his place? Again, no, doesn't make sense. Here's what I think happened. I think yes. that it's more than possible she had had some drinks at that bar. It's more than possible that he offered her a ride home and then took her somewhere else, his own home. Sure. It's more than possible that she had her clothes off for whatever reason and 
could have gotten away, which also that's a great motive in the moment uh, to kill somebody. Yep. Um, he also worked at a quarry. Mm -hmm. This was also in the night. Yep. If ever there was a way, much like you were asking about the, the other case, um, the Rachel case about like, how, what did he do with the body? Yep. This one, it's like, this isn't, I mean, my knowledge of quarries being, I don't know how easy they are to search. I think that if there was ever a place, that's probably a prime spot to hide a body. Yeah. There were and he lived like, at the quarry. Yeah. And there were caves and mine shafts in the area. And he had three days before she was reported missing. Which makes me again, who did she talk to? Did she say, like, I met somebody, I'm going to stay here for a few days? Oh, God, he could have had her alive for th for some of that time. Yeah, I have no idea what this man did. But you can't tell me he's not somehow involved? He has the clothes of a missing woman. Yes. Oh, yeah, that one unraveled me. That, that, that to me, is just like, that's not being proper. That, that it's, I don't even know what to say. That I haven't yep. already said. It it it's just infuriating. Again, when you have the person, the last person to see her alive has her clothing. Yep. Oh, it's madness. It's complete madness. There's what would the what would the what's the story he's writing? She slipped into the she slipped into the quarry and accidentally died. Someone else found her and, and killed her. And you know what I'm saying? Like it's like the simplest story sometimes is true. And when you have a man who's lying, consistently changing his story, has her clothes, was the last person to see her alive. Yeah. I mean, this is. Come on. Yep. I can't. Final case, Reese Kearney. Um, this one is so interesting to me for a point that you brought up, which was that he drove so far away and then came back. So it almost feels, oh no, this isn't the last case. Sorry, second last. Um, so he drove so far away yeah. and then basically was coming back. It He went so, so, so far south and it did seem based on a map that he was just going home. It seemed like he was like, forget it. I'm just going to go home. And then at the last minute decided, forget it. And suddenly started going, yes, I just had to do the northeast south <laughs> so that I knew terrible with directions um then he went far west so it seemed like he was in fact heading to where his brother lived and then just didn't make it it yeah i mean I, is it possible he just couldn't take it anymore i don't know but i i'm fascinated again by he was last he left on december 15th he was seen very, very far south getting gas on the 21st. And then the co the motorcycle, motorbike, whatever we're calling it, was found like February 8th. I mean, sometimes there's also the possibility that two things can be true. Sure. Perhaps he was taking off. Yeah. He took out that money. Maybe he was like, I'm going to go start a new life or I'm going to do whatever. Sure. <laughs> But that person disappearing and some of his belongings and the, the bike being found would say to me that he he had ran into trouble. Oh, yeah. I could see it. <laughs> especially if the bike if he's was never found. Especially if he's traveling around with a lot of cash and someone comes across him. I mean, yeah, it's possible. To it's me, possible. it's just, again, that it's like just because he potentially was trying to run away and start a new life doesn't mean that he wasn't also murdered. Correct. All right. Now the final case. There it is. Try. -y. Um, this one is fascinating to me because there clearly is, there's, there's a, there's a person with a motive here, which is whoever this man was, that it seems they had some sort of altercation right. on the road. Maybe somebody bumped somebody or something happened at some point driving. Feels like he most likely followed her 
to that gas station. If they're in a heated discussion, as described, you know, did things escalate? It feels like that's the only... It doesn't feel likely to me that at one o'clock in the morning, yep. she had an altercation with a man who potentially had followed her to that gas station and then someone else killed her. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, that doesn't, the odds of that. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And, the and way, I guess the way her car was found, it is more than possible that she was leaving the gas station, noticed he was following her. And she was watching like in her mirror and that's how she went off the road, got her car stuck, ran to get away from the guy. Yes. He, and then she threw her purse at him. He attacked her and then grabbed her and the purse. Didn't take the time to look for everything. That makes sense. Yep. In the moment, it's super dark. You just grab it and then you go and who knows what he did, but he could have run her off the road. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. That's the first place I go is what was the damage to that car? Was there damage on the back of that car? It didn't look like it. Okay. I'd have to look at it again, but I did see a photo of the car stuck in the ditch. I'll see if I have it here. God, I take some odd photos. Um, I know you can't really see because I'd already made it into a smaller thing but i mean her car looks okay, oh i see okay but it's stuck in like some weird you can see it a little better oh yeah it's stuck in some yep. sort of ditch like she turned and didn't mean to or i mean who knows we can't see the front or the sides he could have sideswiped her yep and i guess for me you know this feels basic enough that I shouldn't have to say it, but given the pattern that we've seen with investigations on these cases, yes. my question is, was there no description of the vehicle that the man was driving that was talking to her at the gas station? If the CCTV picked up the two of them talking, Arguing. yeah, one would hope that there would be enough cct angles that we would at least even if you couldn't make out a license plate that you would at least see the make and model or or a or a brief description yep there was nothing i've seen photos i've seen photos of the cctv but cctv footage um of her very clearly arguing with someone and his face is pixeled out well, why are they doing that? I assume they checked some sort of alibi or whatever. I assume they've cleared whoever that is and are like, we're not going to, you know, Come we're on. not going to press it further or something. But yeah, I have a lot of questions. <sighs> that seems insane to me. Yeah. Look, again, a lot of questionable things with the police and there are good police we know there are we say this all the time it's just uh there were some complications throughout this for police it seems well and also the cases of of police officers doing great work which exist they don't typically make it to true crime podcasts <laughs> so it's just because great call you know what i mean like great call yeah. yeah you're right. Or or you know sometimes when we talk about solved cases there's there's wins there but we talked about a lot of unsolved stuff on this show specifically and so yes. obviously those cases are going to be the ones that were bungled and I don't need to tell you if we get into the statistics of how many of these crimes are constantly happening. Yeah. Um statistically speaking there's going to be there's going to be people fumbling the bag and unfortunately yeah. the show has become a showcase for that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Listen, police fumbles. Yeah, exactly. And if we Chrissy were being Oxborough, cutesy, they'd be foibles. The fuzz fumbles. That would be our cassette tape if we released like a best of. Thank you very much. Uh, Christy Oxborough, amazing work as always. I am always yeah. blown away 
by the episodes that you curate, it is, I don't even know how you begin. I don't think I could ever do it myself. And uh, that's just because my brain works very differently than yours. Um, but I am blown away. And thank you for your work as always. You are too kind. I speak the truth. And we thank you, dear listeners, for listening to this episode of the show. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. And of course, if you want some more content, you want some more of these two chuckleheads chopping it up, then go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails, where you can subscribe to our uh, bonus system over there. We got bonus episodes. We do live monthly Q&As. It's a lot of fun. Um... And the only place to get official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well if you're inclined. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Jack Royal. This, of course, is our January patrons poll pick. If over on Patreon, we also offer a monthly poll where you can help vote for a case that we will cover on this feed of the show. Uh, so Jack Royal it is next week. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? For reasons I'm not 100% sure of. First one that came to my head. Good night, John Stamos. Good night, Dave Coulier. <laughs> <laughs>